Remember, he asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. He came back again and found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more, praying the third time the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Thank you, Christopher. Well, today's going to be a great day. You get to have your favorite lunch. It's the one you bring, but it's still going to be your favorite, right? Why would you buy one that you don't even like? So come to the park with us and have a chance to uh, meet lots of people and sit around and talk or play games, and so that's going to be a great time today. Also, LTC is going to be in, we- in uh, Tucson this next weekend, so I know a lot of parents are getting ready, and if uh, you're interested in what our kids are doing, you might want to go down there and uh, be able to watch some of them and uh, be able to see what they do. And so it'll be a, a great time for them and being able to uh, see some of the things that they've been practicing. And just before church, I saw Matt and Sandy. I mean, that's great. So we have been praying for you guys a long time, and I don't know where you sat, but anyway. Oh, they got way back over here. So we have been praying for you guys a long time, and uh, it's always, always great when a miracle visits. <laughs> and so we're glad that you guys are here. We talked a couple weeks ago about the triumphal entry and about how Jesus rides into Jerusalem for the first time and is treated like a conquering hero. And that's really what he is. And after that ride in and all the praise and all the people looking at him and all the people just cheering him on and then he rides in and he goes from there to the temple. And then the temple, he finds things that are not good. The money changers are there more for business than they are for prayer. And so he clears the temple, overturns the tables, and throws the people out. And as he does that, then the children come. Because they're not afraid of him. And the lame and the blind come, and they're healed. And then worship really takes place in God's temple that he intended. And so it's one of those amazing stories that you see as the house of prayer that has been cleansed is shown to be exactly what Jesus wants it to be. And today we want to talk about a place of prayer, but maybe a little bit different. And I do appreciate Michael uh, singing the song or trying to sing the song so you guys be sure and help because he tries to pick songs that are perfect with the lesson and certainly that one is and so jesus in the passage that's been read to us is about to go to a garden the garden of gethsemane he's been there a lot he goes there to pray It's not an unusual thing. The disciples kind of know, but this one is going to be very, very different. Because it's not just a time where he goes to pray. This is the last time he will go to that garden to pray. Because he knows exactly what's going to happen. He has already dismissed Judas, and Judas has gone out and is finding a way and finding soldiers. They're gathering to be able to betray Jesus, to capture, to arrest and to put Jesus to death. And so as you look at the passage and look at what's going on, we see how Jesus does this. Jesus is going, and he goes down and across the valley, and he goes to the garden to pray. And he takes three special ones with him. And he tells them that he is sorrowful even to death. Because he is facing his own death. That's really what it's about. And Jesus is on his way to his own tragedy. And he says, I want you to stay here with me and keep watch. 
Keep watch. What does that mean? What are we watching for? Well, I think the phrase as it's used here, keep watch, has the idea of prayer. You're supposed to pray. You're supposed to watch out for yourself. Watch out for what's coming. I don't know that he's looking for Judas and for the soldiers and that they're going to protect Jesus. But he says, I want you to keep watch for what's going on. I want you to keep watch for yourself because this is a very dangerous time. So you watch and pray. And then as Jesus goes, he goes to his own prayer. And as he prays, he says, if it's possible, let this cup pass. I don't want to have to drink it. I don't want to have to do this. I think he's known all along that this was coming. He's known that this is part of the process. And so he knows this is exactly what he's supposed to do. And yet, at this point, he's like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to take part in this. But he realizes the prophecy from so many years before and how it talks about him and that it is going to be a suffering servant. The people have been looking for a Savior. And that's what Savior means in this case because Jesus is on his way to a tragedy. The prayer he offers is maybe to learn about his own acceptance of what's happening. Each one brings him a little bit closer to the truth and a little bit closer to the understanding of the situation and to what needs to happen there. And so the first one is to pray, I don't want to do this. Please let this cup pass. Let it be gone. Let it go by. I don't want to have to do this. And he comes back to his disciples, and he finds his disciples sleeping. Well, it's probably late already. They've had a big meal. They've had the Passover, and so here they are, and it's quiet, and it's dark. And I don't know about you, but do you ever fall asleep when you pray? I've heard two different things on that. One is that uh, how great it is to be able to say, I'm so comfortable with you, God, that I just fall asleep. The other one is, how dare you insult God by falling asleep on him? I'm not sure which one of those to take. If you ever fall asleep on your wife, you will know which one is the better one. I think God may have the same reaction to us. I'm not sure he goes along with, uh, yeah, I'm just so comfortable I fall asleep talking to you. That doesn't work with uh, other situations, let me just put it that way. As you think about this and look at what Jesus is doing, he then comes back to his disciples. Why would he come back? I mean, he's not done praying yet, but he comes back to his disciples and finds them asleep. And so, you know, now what? Well, he wakes them up and says, why are you sleeping? Couldn't you even pray for an hour? Hmm, I don't know. Can you pray for an hour? Do you usually pray for an hour? When it's dark and quiet and after a big meal, do you get an hour before... But Jesus is very expectant that that is what they're supposed to do because that's the instructions that he gave them. But why he comes back, maybe to get strength, maybe to encourage, maybe to just talk to them for a minute and then, but he finds them asleep. So after the instructions, keep watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation because temptation is very close. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Is that an excuse? Or is that just a statement of what you're going to have to face? And I expect you to overcome it. And so I know you want to pray, but don't let the weakness that you have be something that gets in the way. The second prayer that Jesus begins to offer is a little bit different. It's not, let this cup pass. It is, Father, if it can't pass any other way than that I drink it, 
than thy will be done. Always the thy will be done, but it's changed a little bit now into him accepting the fact that perhaps it is not a matter of God taking this away from him, but that it is a matter of him having to go through it. And that the only way around or out of this situation is not that God removes things, but that God rescues him by saying, I'll, I will help you as you go through this. And I think that's true of our prayers as well, because a lot of times we pray, God, take this away. God, remove this. God, rescue me. God, I don't want to have to do this. But we never get to the second stage where we go back and pray and say, let thy will be done if I need to go through it. And that's the point where Jesus gets to. I may need to go through this. He comes back again, finds them still sleeping. He must have felt very alone in all of this. How can this happen? I mean, the one most important time, and everybody falls asleep on me. And so he must have felt very alone. He knows that they're going to run away. He knows the prophecy. He knows that they may feel like they're safe in the garden, but they're not really safe in the garden at all. And he might have felt very helpless and horrible because he is alone. It's going to hurt. It's going to be horrible. The beating that's coming, I don't know if he anticipated or not. The crowd that is screaming. But there is so much hatred against him. The world has turned against him. And he sits for just one moment with God, feeling the helplessness and feeling his weakness. I think maybe he needed a song like the one we're about to sing. Michael? My heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I give to you, take control, I give my body a living sacrifice. Lord, take control, take control, my heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I give to you, take third time Jesus wakes him up and says you can sleep later you don't need to sleep now the betrayers at hand they're coming and he knows the soldiers are coming he knows that they're there he knows that this is going to be the time when everything starts everything begins and there is no turning back there will be no more quiet moments and the next peaceful time that he will have is his death Why did he stay? Why didn't he run away? I mean, he could have. Peter had argued that before, you will never die. And about this time, it might seem like a good argument. 
But when the enemy is so close, he decides to face them. Turn the other cheek means something very, very different. It means you're still in the fight. So why would he stay? He had prayed that there was a way around it. He had prayed that it doesn't have to happen. And then he prayed that he can go through it. He went on for standing up for what's right, for a cause. And I think we realize that and we see that. I want you to realize that today. That's the main part of what I want you to get, that there is a reason, there is a time when we must face tragedy and run toward it. We realize that there are times when people would die for freedom. We send soldiers. And there are times here when that happens as well. It's a concept that goes back for a long time in this country. That people would actually die so that freedom could be born and that freedom could continue. That salvation could be born. And that salvation could continue. The next verse says, While he was still speaking, Judas came up, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. And they came up and they laid hands on Jesus and seized him. It must have been an acceptable thing. It must have been something that Judas did a lot. Because I think he's trying to say, oh yes, no problem, nothing going on, just a bunch of soldiers behind me. Hi. What a difficult situation that you think you can just sneak up on somebody and And Jesus says, do what you came to do. He knows it's coming. He knows what it is. And he knows he's got to go through it. Peter decides to act. And so he has one of the two swords that they have. And he gets that and decides to swing. And sure enough, he does. And he connects. He gets an ear. Well, that's really not going to do that much when there's a whole army behind Judas. But Jesus is very upset at that. He says, no, no violence from my side. It's actually Jesus' allies that fired the first shot. And if they fired the first shot, then doesn't it mean they're the ones that started the war? And so Jesus immediately stops and he doesn't want that kind of violence. And he says to them, In verse 52, Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the Scripture be fulfilled that it must be so? In that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scripture of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples left him and fled. And so Jesus rebukes him, put up your sword. I mean, it's common sense, it's kind of smarter that way. You're not going to get anything. Uh, You're not that good a warrior, obviously. And then he says, don't you know that I have other resources? I have, I could just pray one prayer to God and I could ask for, send the angels. And he would send 12 legions of angels. 12 legions, how many is that? It's like 72,000 if you want an accurate number for what a legion was. But you can remember some of the battles An angel came to the battle with Sennacherib, one. 
and all of the army was destroyed. It only takes one. And he says, I could get 72,000 angels. It's more power than you would ever imagine. That's all I would need. But I'm not here to be rescued. I'm here to go through this. And so he acts because of Scripture, not fear. He says, don't you know that Scripture needs to be fulfilled because Scripture is so very, very important. And it is the thing that stands. And all of our actions go by what Scripture says. Because that's the reason that we move and that's the reason that we do and that's the motivation. And Jesus says, then I will do what Scripture says. I will go through this. He says, you came out against a robber talking to the rest of them. He says, don't you understand? This is fulfillment of prophecy. You had a robber already. You had Barabbas. You had captured him. You caught him and you let him go. But this is a place where I'm not getting out of this. And that's exactly what you see him doing. He's running toward the tragedy. I don't know if we grasp this. It's kind of hard for us to realize all the things that are going on here. And it's such a familiar story that we hear all the time. Jesus prayed in the garden, right? And they still came and arrested him. And just to spoil the ending, yes, he's going to be crucified. Just in case you didn't know that. You knew that, Robin, right? Okay. And we all know that. We all know exactly what's going to happen. We all know that, yeah, this is the end, but does it make sense in our world today? And so let me maybe help a little bit with that. Let's see what God is doing with the tragedy, because I think Satan in this case is preparing for victory. He thinks he's won. I think he has all the logic in the world, but that's all he's got is all the logic of the world. And it looks like he's about to win. And so he offers temptations in ignorance. He doesn't know the faith that it takes to overcome. And all of his temptation is no match for the love of God. The best way I know to illustrate this for you and maybe make this is from a couple of articles. And taking you back about five years, do you remember the bombing at the Boston Marathon? And several since then, and school shootings, and church shootings, and that there has been so much violence that has happened in our time. So much tragedy that is there. Do you run away, or do you run toward it? One of the articles that I found was from maybe a familiar character to you called Mr. Rogers. I don't know if any of you remember Mr. Rogers or not. But this was just after the Boston Marathon bombing. And it said, From the moment the news first arrived about Monday's tragic double bombing in Boston, people across America, and likely across your social media networks, tuned in to a familiar face for comfort, Mr. Rogers. And now it's likely that you have seen someone share his advice from the children's TV star on coping, on coping with horrible events. He said, when I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news. My mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words. And I am always comforted by realizing that there are still so many helpers, so many caring people in this world. And the article continues, these are wonderful words intended for adults who may have faced uncomfortable questions from children. But as we've seen after the Boston Marathon tragedy and after Sandy Hook, when the quote was first circulated by PBS on Facebook, they apply to all of us. When terrible images with incomprehensible destruction and suffering fill our screens and browsers. Of course, our eyes and our children's eyes are trained on the damage 
and the people running away from the scene. But there are people running toward the scene, too. The helpers really are everywhere. And the simple wisdom from one of our most beloved public figures reminds us of that. That no matter how old you are, you can find something besides pure terror in what Mr. Rogers calls the scary news. That's what happens when you see this. And so, do we have scary news? Absolutely. We have times when it doesn't seem to make sense. Times when it seems as if the disaster has come upon us and the tragedy is here. And we realize what happens. But do you run away or do you run toward it? Jesus was running toward it. And that's what you have to realize. That's what you have to know. Is that when the bombing happened, there were people who ran toward it. We live in a world where there is so much destruction and so many things that have happened and sin has destroyed so much in our lives. And we just try to pray, God, get me out of this. God, help me through this. God, take it all away. God, fix our world. And he might be saying you need to go through it. And it's not a matter of you saying, I I, I want everything just taken away. But it's more a matter of God saying to you, I want you to face the tragedy that's in your life. I want you to own up to it, and I want it to be forgiven because someone has died for that. And Jesus went to a tragedy, his own, his own death. And we look at what happens in our life, and we look at the sin around us and the people around us and how they seem to make such terrible choices. And they do so many things that cause us so much unhappiness in their life. And then the prayer is always, well, God rescue. God take it away. And the truth is, he wants you to stand up to it. He wants you to run toward it. He wants you to say that tragedy is going to make me somebody different because I don't ever want to have to go through that again. There's a person named Susan Sparks who wrote this. Mercifully, in times like these, don't happen often. However, when they do, excruciating. When faced with a surly crowd, I always fall back to the words of a longtime comic friend who's Warn me to never allow yourself to be defined by your audience. She's a comic, and she has to face an audience sometimes, and sometimes the audience isn't nice. He went on to explain that it's inevitable to encounter a random, angry, unstable person, the person who wants to bring you down. But no matter what happens, you can't let up, and you can't shrink in fear. Just the opposite, you have to stand straighter in defiance and keep on going. While a great lesson in stand-up and in life, his words were taken to a whole new level this week by the responses to the Boston Marathon bombing. And the people of Boston didn't allow themselves to be defined by the actions of an angry, unstable people bent on bringing them down. They didn't let up. They didn't shrink in fear. They stood straighter in defiance and kept on going. One of the most poignant images was highlighted in Thomas Friedman's recent New York Times op-ed. He noted that in the video, images taken immediately after the explosion, you could see people running toward the blast, the ultimate act of courage and defiance. Let's schedule another Boston Marathon as soon as possible, he wrote. We should make this one longer, from Boston to the site of the World Trade Center, to the Pentagon, to remind ourselves that we are not afraid. Given the times in which we live, we need a lot of those reminders. Our world is filled with angry souls that want to bring us down whether it's a bomber 
or a sender of poisonous letters or a murderer with a gun. If Boston taught us anything this week, is that we don't have time to be scared. Life is fleeting. And we no longer have the luxury of making assumptions about the future. We don't want tomorrow to bring... We don't know what tomorrow will bring. And as Nelson Mandela said, life is short. Don't waste it playing small. We cannot allow ourselves to be defined by the angry people of this world. We cannot let up. We cannot shrink in fear. The best thing, the only thing we can do is straighten up in defiance. And I pray that in the future our world will be free from the horrors that we have witnessed this week. And I hope this will be the last act of terrorism. We all know, however, that the odds are against us in that hope. In comedy and in life, there are always the there will always be people who want to bring us down. So all I can do is utter this humble prayer. When crisis hits, when the angry person strikes, may God give us courage to stay the course, to straighten up in defiance, and to always, always, Run toward the blast. And we see lots of tragedy. We see broken relationships. We see friends that are torn apart. And we see jobs that are lost. We see so many heartaches in our world. And we could just try and pretend that they don't matter. But Jesus came to do something about those. The popular saying going around now is a hero is someone who runs toward danger when others are running away from it. And Jesus did run toward the blast, toward the tragedy, in order to make freedom for us all. And he tells us, I want you to take up your cross and follow me. Hard to do. It's easier to run away and say, God, please fix it. We've all seen this tragedy of sin. But we have to do something about the destruction. It's destroying our friends. It's destroying our society. And Jesus is the seed that was planted. And when that seed springs to life, that grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies... It produces fruit. It's the thing that grows. And God's grace and mercy continues to grow. Without that understanding, we don't really know what the gospel is all about. And so take up your cross and follow me is the gospel. It's on its way to a cross. We go toward our own death. I don't know exactly what the timing will be, but we run toward the tragedy. That's what Jesus was doing in the garden. That's what the prayer was about. Give me strength to be able to do it. And so maybe today you're ready to face your own sin and your own tragedy in your life. Maybe it's one of those times when you realize this is too much. And I just need to let God take control. And I want to deny the sin and the tragedy and the person that I've been and let that person die. And let me repent of all of those things and be baptized into Christ and be given His Holy Spirit and be added to His church so that I can see so much the blessing of God in my life in the face of tragedy rather than just the tragedy. Jesus does have a great thing for us. Take up your cross. Follow him. Find the blessing. Because in running toward the tragedy that we have produced in our own lives, we can truly find the grace of God and how overwhelming he is as he guides us in this world. Shall we stand up?